Hello? Hello? I don't know if anyone can hear me, or even how anyone could hear me, but the on-air light remains lit, and I am compelled to follow it like a carrot on a stick until the end of time. Well, that is, of course, if time hasn't already ended. But if, back on Earth, time does indeed march on, if the hands on the clocks keep moving from 12 to 1, and if you are listening, my friends, then listen well, for I have quite a strange tale for you this evening. This is William Owens, broadcasting on satellite radio. I'm not sure which station I'm broadcasting to, and my equipment has ceased displaying numbers. For a while, it was actually displaying Roman numerals, and then the screen went dark for uh, about two days, and now it just says uh, A-A-A-A-A, in all capitals. You see, folks at home, if there are any folks at home that can still hear me, if I'm not just broadcasting my voice into the darkness, where it could be heard by all manner of scheming and lurking things. You see, just last week, seven days ago exactly, I was seated in the recording studio, preparing for my usual 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. slot on Briarwood's community radio. As I switched on my equipment and prepared to fade down the music, the steady buzz of ungrounded electricity filled the room. Now, this, in and of itself, was no cause for alarm, but the sound was soon accompanied by a continuous and progressive vibration of such strength and relentlessness that I feared my teeth would loosen from my gums and that my eyes might roll from their sockets rendering me blind and unable to eat all but liquid and gel-based foods. These vibrations intensified, and I have to admit with some shame that I was reduced to a hysterical and quivering heap on the floor of the recording booth. And as I lay there, my muscles tight with fear and grim anticipation, do you know what I thought of? I thought about you. I may be gone now, but all of you, all of you folks at home, you're still there, oh, somewhere. And somehow, as I knelt on the gray-blue, wall-to-wall carpeting, shivering and trembling with fear, I felt as if you were there with me, all of you. Each and every listener, packed shoulder to shoulder, stuffed wall to wall in my little booth, just shouting and urging me on, saying, Live, William! Don't give up! There was this terrific boom. My stomach flip-flopped. I experienced a sensation of complete weightlessness, and my fear was banished. For a moment, I thought my heart would stop. I got to my feet and looked out the big window on the front of the building. Oh, friends, if you're listening, if anyone or anything is listening, oh, the sight I saw when I looked out that window, if there are words to adequately describe it, my friends, I do not know them. An endless, undulating field of velvet night, dotted with a myriad of colored stars and nebulas of unimaginable size. Space, friends. I was, I am, in space. 
I cannot say where exactly in the cosmos I'm currently located, although I know it must be far, far from home. I can tell because the stars, stars just don't look the same. I'm quite sure, well, at least I have this feeling, that these are stars which no earthly eye has ever gazed upon. My fear returned then. Whose wouldn't? Flung into an endless alien void with no idea of how or why you came to be there? How many hours passed, I can't really say. I just sat on the floor, knees pulled to my chest, and I stared suspiciously at the door and the big window until I became hungry. I quickly discovered, and this is odd, but the break room is fully stocked, almost excessively so. In fact, although I've eaten two hearty meals each day for the last three days, my supplies don't appear to be dwindling. Electricity and running water, hot water even, are also mysteriously in ample supply. My chief enemy then, alone as I was in my perpetually drifting studio, became loneliness. I slept and I dreamed. I dreamed of laughter and the shaking of hands of warm embraces and delicate fingers running through long strands of hair. I dreamt of blue eyes and of flirtatious smiles. When I awoke, I began to talk to myself. I began to talk to the walls. My fear of all that space outside just went away and I took to these long, uninterrupted episodes during which I gazed outwards, giving names to the constantly changing landscapes of heavenly bodies. I'm a bit ashamed to admit, but there did come a dark day when I opened the door, not intending to do myself harm, but just in an effort to indulge my curiosity. I mean, I understand physics well enough to know that a simple wooden door should long ago have been torn asunder by the vacuum of space. I opened the door and I waited, but nothing happened. A warm bubble of air and atmosphere appears to extend around the detached floating studio. Furthermore, I was able to confirm my suspicion that the studio is the only building plucked from the surface of the earth. I confess, at that moment, I despaired of ever seeing another human being ever again. I perch in that threshold legs dangling above eternal nothingness. The thought occurred to me to jump, but the horror of those final moments of spiraling endlessly through the universe as my skin froze and the breath was forced from my lungs, oof, the fear of an end like that far outweighed my lonely despair. Then, my friends, then, a miracle or a sign. The on-air light, the one above the recording booth window, the light that only comes on when Briar Woods Community Radio is connected to the satellite and broadcasting live, that light switched on. Oh, folks, if you can hear me now, you must understand, you must. That light, to me, was a beacon of hope. It was a single glistening ear in the dark of eternal space. You may not be able to reach me, listeners, but now I think I can reach you. And I had this feeling, this tiny nagging certainty that someone on Earth can still hear me. Friends, Folks back home, something is happening. Something is changing. I looked out the window and saw something new. A planet, purple in color, surrounded by swirling green clouds, hovers only a few hundred thousand miles away. Or, well, possibly a few million. I'm not really good at judging distance. Now, I've seen stars and planets in the offing, but never close before. Never like this. And even more amazing, my floating studio feels like it's slowing down. Almost as if 
and I don't want to jinx my chances here, but almost as if it's going to land. I know not what awaits me below, but the thought, the idea of solid ground beneath my feet, of breathable air. Friends, folks, I'm, uh, I am descending towards the surface of the planet now. The outside of the studio is glowing red hot from the friction of descent. The green clouds wind and billow past the windows. The ground, oh, the ground, mauve colored and infinitely textured, rising up so fast, so very fast. My friends, I think I'm going to crash. I think this might be it. Shoot, I can't... Uh, there's too many wires. How am I supposed to know which one? Oh, the light. <clears throat> Hello? Friends? Can you hear me? The on-air light turned off when I landed, but, but now it's come on again. If anyone has heard me since I was ripped so cruelly from the surface of our oh, lovely planet, if I'm not just raving maniacally at the infinite dead expanse of an empty universe, then hear me now. I've landed. Dear friends, I have landed on the surface of an alien world. Well, I say landed, it was really more of a crash, but worry not. I'm still in one piece, and my equipment appears undamaged. Well, apart from a few loose wires. Around me, there stretches an infinite, dusty plain, dotted with irregular pits and mounds. To the west, a forest of crystalline trees with amber-colored leaves crowds the horizon. The east is a barren waste, disturbed only by a single mammoth tower. Smooth, ovular, it appears to be carved from a single piece of cloudy glass. When I arrived, I let my curiosity again overpower my senses, and I opened the door. The air appears breathable, though, and neither the oddly colored earth nor any microscopic life forms did me any immediate harm. At least, I don't think so. I suppose it is possible that I've gone quite mad, and with only my own mind as a gauge, I have yet to realize it. Friends? Friends, dear friends, something's happening. A commotion from the direction of the woods, heavy footfalls and grunting. Can you hear it? Is it really there? Or could it just be a delusion of my own mind? No, I can see them now, friends. I can see the things in the woods. They're, um, they're similar in appearance to gorillas, with pale blue skin and platinum blonde tufts of hair. Their foreheads, though, uh, their foreheads are much larger and more uh, conical than any earth primate I've ever seen. Almost like traffic cones or, or old Gaulish dolmens. Folks, they're definitely heading towards the studio now. I'm, uh, I'm hiding. I can't remember whether or not I locked the front door. I suppose even if I didn't, there's no guarantee the ape creature things would be able to turn a doorknob anyway. I didn't look close enough to see if they have opposable thumbs. Maybe if I just sneak a quick peek now... Oof! One of them has seen me. Friends... The ape creatures are using the door. They are turning the doorknob. I guess that answers my questions about opposable thumbs. I only hope they're friendly, although I can't help picturing them ripping me limb from limb. I keep imagining them as beasts filled with endless hunger, cannibalizing my remains with ritualistic fury. Here they come. This could be it. <laughs> Well, 
Friends, if you're still listening, I'm still here. The apes are friendly, I guess. They seem to be curious about the studio and me. As I speak, uh, three or four of them are milling about examining the furniture and magazines in the front room. One has actually taken to sitting on the arm of my chair and is currently um, grooming me. He's been picking dead skin cells off my scalp and eating them. To be honest, I find this disgusting, but I'm not one to judge, and so I'm letting him have his way. There's a certain fear, or a certain anxiousness in the eyes of some of the creatures. They keep glancing at my speakers and the wires running to the microphone with moderate paranoia, and every so often they all stop, as if listening to something, and turn their gaze towards the tower. Oh, what's this? Oh, uh, thank you. The ape that was grooming me has stopped and is now offering me some sort of crude ape artwork. It's a carved stone tablet. At the top, there's a humanoid creature, not too different in appearance from yours truly. And below this, side by side, is an ape creature and some sort of tall, spindly, androgynous being. Almost like, well, almost like that. There is a creature staring at me through the big front window. Its skin is powder blue and glows faintly. It's nude, as far as I can tell. Its entire body's just one smooth, unmarred surface, bearing no features or marks of any kind. The creature has placed one hand on the window. Maybe a sort of greeting? Or a sign of hostility? It does not speak, but I feel it in my mind. It's curious about the studio, about me, much in the same way the apes are. The apes, by the way, have all retreated at the sight of the tall blue uh, thing. They gather in tight groups and frown in its direction. The thing doesn't speak. I don't think it knows any words, but it wants to know about the studio. It wants the information in my head. Oh, a fight has broken out. The apes are moving on the blue creature, snuffling and beating their chests. Could they be defending me? Or do they simply want first pick of all the stuff in the studio? More blue creatures are arriving from the tower. Uh, they all hover, and they move at unbelievable speeds. <gasps> the apes are being subdued, folks. The blue creatures are employing taser-like devices, shocking the apes. It's cruel, my friends. I can barely stand to watch. I'm not sure if they're fighting over who gets the studio, or... I don't know, but I, I get the feeling that this is an age-old conflict between beast and featureless blue being. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, this stone tablet given to me just moments ago by the ape that groomed me, rather effectively I might add, my scalp feels smooth and clean. This tablet would almost seem to suggest that apes and the blue beings evolved from the same creature. Then, if that's true, perhaps I'm witnessing a conflict between brother species, squabbling eternally over who made the right evolutionary decisions. Now, I think I can amplify my voice through the speakers in the studio if I reverse these two wires and flip this switch. There we go. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. They're all looking at me now, listeners. Both sides have stopped. The blue creatures hover in silence while the ape's fur stirs fitfully in the wind. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, my name is William Owens. I'm from Earth, from far away. I don't know why I'm here, but, but I know when I see something that just shouldn't be happening. And I know you've all got to stop fighting. This um, stone carving I was enigmatically gifted seems to suggest that you're all sort of in the same family. 
Look, just because you've made different evolutionary choices, grown up differently, and adopted separate cultures, it doesn't mean you can't coexist mutually. I mean, where I come from, people usually fight because of greed or pride or because someone told them it was the right thing to do. So I say, stop listening to your heads or your kings or your politicians or, or your gods and just start listening to the beat or, uh, or the thump or um, the strange hum in your heart. For God's sake, you all live on the same planet, right? Right? I've switched off the speakers, friends. I can't think of anything else to say. Outside, the apes have huddled together and are grunting rhythmically. The hovering, spindly blue aliens have bowed their heads, I assume engaging in psychic communication. I suppose I can only wait and hope. Sometimes that's the best thing, right? Huh. Friends and folks back home, something is happening. A single ape has emerged from the huddle and is approaching the blue hovering things. A blue hovering thing, too, has left his fellows to approach his more primitive brother. The ape is muttering and gesturing in the dirt and dust. He appears to be drawling, but I can't really see from here. The blue creature is holding out his long, spindly appendage to the ape. Something is clutched in his phosphorescent fingers. It's... Well, it appears to be some sort of alien lighter. They're giving the apes the gift of fire. Uh-oh, friends, uh, they've turned towards me now. I think part of their new alliance involves mutually dissecting the studio and uh, possibly me. <sighs> oh well, at least I was able to do some good in the cosmos before Hey, wait. What's that? The vibrations have begun again. The apes and the blue, hovering, spindly, glowing creatures are quite close now, mere feet from the door. But the studio feels as if it might lift off in time. It's going to be close, friends. Very, very close. I'm still here. I'm still alive and in one piece. Assuming, of course, this whole thing isn't a complex and vivid hallucination I'm suffering in the moment after death. Well, friends, the apes survived, and their evolutionary superiors have extended to them an olive branch. Although, I suppose it could have been a declaration of war. But I like to think it was an olive branch. It occurs to me alone again in the great vacuum of the void, that we humans are very strange creatures. We spend so much time competing against and fighting against and arguing with the only people that share our dark burden. The burden of being alive right here and right now. We balance moments of such extreme happiness with equally potent stretches of sadness and despair always hoping to emerge on the better side, having learned something of value. Like me. Today I learned that sometimes being alone is good for me. It makes me think. Friends, I hope today you learn an equally valuable lesson. And if you ever look up into the night sky and see the tiny blinking lights of a passing satellite, I hope you'll wave, for it could be me up there and perhaps, if enough people look up and wave, perhaps I can find my way home. You've been listening to Space Cadet, a podcast written and produced by Andy Fleming and scored by Jules Bonner, featuring artwork contributed by Jesse James. If you enjoyed this show, please subscribe to it on iTunes and like our Facebook page, Social media can be a powerful tool, like a lightsaber or a photon torpedo, and with great power comes great responsibility. Feel free to contact us by emailing william.spacecadet at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks.